Thank you, Tom, and thank you so much for coming today. When Kevin Ezell went to be the president of the North American Mission Board, he began trimming everything down and saying, we're going to focus on one thing, and that one thing is planting 15,000 churches across North America. I believe it was a tremendous strategy. In 1962, God was dismissed from public life in America. The Supreme Court made the worst mistake in the biggest ju in, in the history of the American judiciary and asked God to leave public life. God is a gentleman. He stepped out. Since then, everything has deteriorated. Colossians 1.17 says, All things hold together, stick together in Him. And when He's taken out, it all goes down. Name one thing in American society that's not deteriorating. The home, the government, the economy, morals, media, education, everything. It's all in collapse and all near decline. The great influence centers of America are all outside the Bible Belt. Industrial, political, media, moral, entertainment, everything. They're all outside of the Bible Belt. The result has been devastating. Gay marriage in America is now legal in eight states. Gangs are the new family. The home is in deterioration. Our children are shot down in schools. 80% of young adults cohabitate today under age 30 before they marry, if they marry. By the time a young adult has reached the age 21, they've seen 21,000 times that the first kiss is dissolved to the bed on television and movies, and 23 murders before their very eyes. The only answer the government has to gangs and problems and shootings in schools is build more penitentiaries, hire more policemen, make tougher laws. I heard a discussion just last Friday on Fox Network about how many policemen, whether we need one or two in every public school in America. The answer is not how many policemen you have in schools. The answer is how much Jesus Christ, gospel, prayer, and Ten Commandments you have in schools. When we took God out of the public life in America, everything began to deteriorate. If a train is going through town and some guy on the train stealing apples off the train, and you send him to Harvard and give him a $64,000 education, that would be probably per hour, not per year. Now turn him loose on society. He won't steal apples off the train. Now he'll steal the whole train. If your faucet's running over and the sink is stopped up, and all you do is get a mop and a bucket, you're making a big mistake. You must turn off the faucet at the source. And nobody out there gets it. Educators do not. Politicians do not get it. Nothing works except the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ. We have the only answer right here in our hands. Sadly, however, everything in America else is in decline that should not be. The church, 81% of Southern Baptist churches are plateaued or declining. 18 of those 19 percentage points that are declining are growing because they're not declining, are growing because they're trading members. One in 100 Southern Baptist churches is growing because they're baptizing new converts. Think of that. Last year in America, the entire Southern Baptist Convention, all $16 million at hundreds of 16,000 people and hundreds of millions of dollars of us, won only one out of every 1,000 18 to 28 year olds in the United States of America. One in 1,000. 7,000 of our churches baptized no one last year. For 12 years, conversions and baptisms in the Southern Baptist Convention have been in decline. Think of that. Well, sadly, they're saying that before long we will be back at 1955 levels. Pastors are discouraged. 1,500 men, Maranatha Ministry says, in all ministries, all denominations, quit the ministry every single month. 50% of Southern Baptist pastors have a, have a conversation every year with someone about the possibility of quitting the ministry. Denny Autry, the dean of our campus here in Houston, Southwestern Seminary, told me that one in five men, only one in five who graduate from seminary, are still in ministry eight years later. I personally observed it 
about 15% of men in ministry at 21 are still in it at age 65. The result? Islam is the fastest growing religion in America. Mormonism is number two. The occult is number three. And Christianity is fourth. Last year, more people were martyred around the world for Jesus Christ than any year in the history of the entire Christian faith. Missiologists are telling us we have a, maybe a 12-year window to fulfill the Great Commission. But lose the base, and there'll be no Great Commission. Lose America, you lose the world. We are the gospel breadbasket of the nation. And so because the influence centers were in the north, and here's what you've got in the south, a 42% evangelical Christian did not percentage of believers in the Bible Belt, but in the north, only 2% in New York, for example, 1% in all the great cities of Massachusetts, and 1.5% in, many, in Montreal, for example. There's no other answer except to change the north and start churches there. The influence flows downhill. We've got to do it. And it must be our priority, and I'm excited to be a part of that. The Southern Baptist Convention is the largest, best financed, best organized, best trained entity in the history of the Christian faith. We have the troops, we have the know-how, we have the boards, we have the people, we have the money, we have everything. And we have the answer right here in our hands. Nothing else works. If this is not the right strategy, somebody needs to tell us what it is. It's time to send in the Marines. I had the opportunity to speak at the Atlanta conference of NAM, of SIN North America. We're doing five. The next one's in Prestonwood in July 29 and 30 to about 2,500 young church planters. They were ready to storm the beaches and, start and, and charge the gates of hell to plant churches across North America. There's fire in their bones, and it's coming from men and women like you who, by the Spirit of God, are spreading the word about what's going on and helping us to get it done. And America is ready. My own son-in-law had 7,000 people at a church in North America in Omaha, Nebraska on Easter Sunday. He left a church in Houston running 1,800 to plant a church first before that in Pueblo, Colorado. That is the capital of the occult. They started with three couples Today they run 1,400 and they planted five churches out of that. It can be done. Jim Simbla in New York and um, Bill Hybels in Chicago, Rick Warren in California are all preaching to 25 and 30,000 people every Sunday morning. And America is ready. Not only is America ready, and the world is ready. Around the world, the evangelical church is growing faster than the birth rate in Catholic South America. The, birth, the rate of the growth of the church is so fast in Africa, they're saying if, if AIDS doesn't destroy Africa, the entire continent may be Christian by the year 2020. The IMB recently made an interactive website to try to reach young Arab people and get their attention. There are 500 million Arab-speaking people in the world. The response was overwhelming. Are you ready for this? They had 763 million hits in one year. They said every time there was a riot, every time there was chaos in an Arab country, the numbers spiked through the roof. And they are into social media like crazy. This is the answer. We have the answer in our hands. And the world is indeed ready. Yes, I know it's very hard. Many of our churches are in decline. Many of us are hurting right here in, in Houston as well as the cities that are listening on this on video across the South. How can I get my people to go? How can I send my money? How can I urge my men to leave when we're drying up here? How can we send our money when we can't pay our bills here? Lose the base and we lose the world, and we have no base from which to win the rest of the base. Well, let me tell you a story that may help. In 1969, the First Baptist Church it had fallen on hard times. The second oldest Baptist church in all of Texas was considering disbanding. Then God began to turn things around. They had a $300,000 budget they could not meet. Mop buckets and hymnals were stored in the baptistry because we hadn't baptized anyone 
in nearly two years. Helen McCullough was the only person in 45 years that had gone into full-time Christian ministry. And the church was in serious, serious trouble. Fast forward, 44 years later, the leadership of David Self, Pastor Greg Mott, to this very moment, God has turned things around. Now today, since that time, about 18,000 people have been baptized. The budget is $24 million a year and has exceeded. 800 people to 900 people were ordained, went to seminary, and have gone out of this church into full-time Christian ministry. God has done great things. Now, how did that happen? How do we get to where we are? I want to tell you some reasons quickly. Number one, vision. Aristotle said, give me a place to stand. I can move the world. The most important ingredient in any decision is not what is, it's what can be, the potential. John Kennedy said, some people see things that are and ask why. I see things that are not and ask why. Why not? We saw the First Baptist Church as having an influence in the city that could pump life and encouragement and example and give ourselves away to all the other churches. And that started the whole thing. We built a prayer altar of about 80 to 100 feet around the front of the church. Focal point of the services each Sunday morning. Prayer was the second thing. It was five to 10 minutes. People would come. The deacons would pray with people at the altar. We built a 24-hour day prayer room and threw away the key. Around the clock prayer meetings often were held. Wednesday night Bible study, 30 minutes of teaching, 30 minutes of prayer, prayer, prayer. Number three was hard work. Our staff knew what it meant to come to church early, roll up their sleeves, and go to work. I only fired three staff members, Pastor Greg, in 30 years. I fired all three of them the same day for the same reason. They're all three lazy. Number four, the church was biblical conservative. Biblically conservative. In a, church, in a world that is devoid of foundations and moral absolutes, underneath the skin of it all, there is a hunger for solidarity. And the Bible is the word of God, only what God says. And when people hear it, it makes a difference. Number five, the church was opportunistic. We seized the moment, as I'm asking you to do now. When Jesus Christ was on the front page of Time, Newsweek, and Reader's Digest in 1972, the Jesus movement, kids were rocking on the beaches and drinking Jesus snow cones and wearing Jesus t-shirts. It wasn't thought up by Nashville. It was a spontaneous movement of the Spirit of God. We moved in. We put money in people and had a three-month protracted youth revival. 11,000 kid, kids were saved. One night we baptized over 400 and baptized nearly all night long. God blessed because things were hot and we moved in. The Exorcist was a movie that was real hot in 1973. All the students, all the psychology and philosophy and, and sociology classes at UH and Rice were debating it. We put a full ad in the paper, come Sunday, I'm going to preach on The Exorcist. What it says is right, what it says is wrong, what it doesn't say at all. We had 145 college students saved. Then there was expository preaching, not just telling what the Bible says, but with real life application. We hear a lot about expository preaching today, but expository preaching is not enough. You just leave me with a grand, therefore what? Listen to Tony Evans, listen to Swindoll. They're the best preachers in America today. And they all finish each point with a life application principle. It's talk that can walk how this preaching applies to real life. Number seven, Sunday morning Bible study. Jesus built his church on himself. The structure he built on the foundation of himself was the small group. He poured his life into 12 men that, that changed the world. And so that's why Bible study Sunday morning is important. That's the small group. If people do not come to a Bible study and get connected personally with one or two people in six weeks, they'll be gone in six months. You can't connect to a crowd. It is extremely important. Number eight, integrity and leadership. Moral failure and spiritual failure was virtually unknown throughout the staff and deacons and leadership of our wonderful church. 1956, by survey, the pastor was the number one most respected man in the community. Today, after moral failures and scandals all over the press, he's only number 12 by survey. They used to go to church believing the pastor was a man of God. He had to prove that he wasn't. 
Today, the public goes to church believing the pastor is not a man of God. He has to prove that he is. Number nine, celebration wor worship. Hate to tell you, but pipe organs are out and bongo drums and guitars are in. It's a different way. They, listen very closely. If you're going to have a church tomorrow, you have to reach young adults and young people today. Okay? And if you're going to reach them, you have to speak their language. If I go to Africa, I can speak English. In Africa, they don't speak English over there. I have to get an interpreter. I don't change the message, but I put the message in their language. And their language is Igbo, Arab, Hausa, Swahili. Put the message in their language. Listen to me. This young adult generation, without which there's no tomorrow, of which we're only reaching one a thousand in the United States of America, you've got to speak their language. And their language is their music and social media. Number nine, a, number ten, a loving spirit. The spirit of your church is everything. The main thing I heard, most common comment I heard all week long was people say, Preacher, I just can't wait till Sunday. People couldn't wait to get in the auditorium. You know why? Because Jesus was there. A loving, warm spirit. And it all starts with you. If you're Dr. Horsefeathers and Professor Whistlebritches, people never get past you to what you got to say. The likability factor is huge in the ministry. You've got to be yourself. Love people. Walk up and down the aisles. Be informal. Don't be Dr. This and that. Just be Pastor Greg. Just be Brother John. Just be Joe. That's the secret of, one of the secrets of Billy Graham. That needs humility. He could have been Dr. B. Franklin Graham. He has 30 honorary degrees. Never mentioned one of them. He's still the kid next door. A loving, natural spirit. Throw away the order of service printed in the formality of sevenfold amens. Lighten up. If you want people to walk those aisles, that, you create a fluid atmosphere with the music with the spirit, with the preaching, with prayer, because you cannot hatch eggs in a refrigerator. Number 11, unity. John 17, Jesus said five times, praying for us, may my people be one, in order that the world may believe I came from you. See, the world doesn't read the Bible, but the world leaves, reads us. We're the body of Christ joined to the head in heaven. When we get together in honor and love, preferring one another, each consider the other more important than himself. No agenda but Jesus. Jesus is recreated in a healthy whole body. And that attracts people. When Jesus was here, he was in one body. Women adored him. Men would die for him. Little children called all over him. Today, Jesus Christ is here in a different body, a bigger body. That's why he said, it's what I've done you'll do in even greater things. So when the church is in harmony and unity, not fussing over little dinky stuff, not voting over every little light bulb and having raucous business meetings. That healthy whole body draws people to Jesus Christ, and it is essential to the blessing of God on the church. Number 12, state-of-the-art buildings and relevant marketing. Now, I want to be very clear about this. The outside of the buildings is not a critical issue. As long as you've got current, sharp day signage, nicely landscaped, and keep it fixed up, keep it painted. The outside doesn't matter. But what happens inside those buildings is very, very important. You come into church. If your church looks like the 50s, these young adults are going to think you're from the 50s, and they're going to say bye-bye and pass you right on by. We have always made a major emphasis. You see, walk, walk through the lobby, walk around to a state-of-the-art building, and you can do that less expensive than you think. Number five, number, th number 13, a philosophy of reach the children, reach the parents. Think about it. Donald uh, um, Mac McDonald's, I fast forwarded, McDonald's has built the world's largest food chain. And what do they built it on? Great hamburgers? Well, personally, I think there's a lot better hamburgers than other places. They have built it on fun, happy meals, good times, slides and swings, giveaway. All over town on Sunday morning. Kids are up, tugging on the bed at 6 o'clock, saying, come on to Daddy, I want to go to church. And it isn't just painting. It isn't just painting Donald Duck riding in Noah's Ark on the walls. It's what happened inside those walls. Study the First Baptist Church of Springdale, Arkansas, and study Second Baptist Church of Houston. They get it in children's ministry that reach the children and reach the parents. Very, very, very important. Two more. Number 14 an indomitable sense of conquest. 
This church, as all great growing churches, has always had a spirit of holy drivenness, a restlessness. We will not stop. We're going to cross the next river, give the next dollar, build the next building, send the next missionary, win the next soul. We will not be satisfied. More, 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 more. We never saw how we could afford to do anything we did. We just did it and trusted God. You don't come to the waters, the Red Sea, and look in the water and see if that thing had ever split, I'd get in it. Moses said, stand still, boys, and see what God's going to do. We're going forward. When the commitment to go forward is made, then God gives the provision and the water split. Don't ever stop up. Don't let anything let you down. Don't let anything stop you. No excuse. You can do it, and we can be, win this project. I want to come back to the end of where I just started. I think David Self, our great associate and executive pastor who led us so marvelously through the interim, and Pastor Greg, who has done an unbelievable job these last seven or eight years, would totally agree with this. The 15th and last thing, as we go back to where we started, that is in the DNA of this church that underlines it all is a selfless, give-yourself-away spirit and attitude. That's what God blesses. As I recall, a cross is still the heart of the Christian faith. And a cross is I crossed out. Luke 6, 38. Given, it'll be given unto you. Now listen very carefully. The difference in what I'm saying in the health and wealth theology is this. We never, ever give anything, time, love, money, anything in order to receive. We give out of love for Jesus Christ and those for whom he died. But it is true that when you do that, incidental to the giving, you do receive. I want to tell you about how this church became a give-yourself-away church. And I believe that's the great reason for God's blessing on this church beneath the surface of all of these other 14 things. And that's what I'm asking you to go home and do in your church. That way you'll, you see, when you give, you receive. The more you give in people the money, the more God gives back to you. It's a win-win for you. It's a win-win for the kingdom. It's a win-win for the gospel. It's a win-win for North America. Tell your story and we'll be through. About 1982, the director of the Union Baptist Association came to my office said, Brother John, you're the pastor of First Baptist Church. You got the name first on the church, and you need to lead us and help us. I said, the answer is yes. What's the question? He said, we've got seven, 67 churches in this association. They're dying and declining that will close their doors in one year. My heart went out. I love those little churches. I came to those little churches. I preached five years before I ever saw 200 people together in one place at one time. I said, we'll help get them together. Three weeks later, we had a breakfast in this room. They were all bivocational. Sixty-five of them came. I said, what do you need? They said, money and people, money and people, money and people. Immediately on the church envelope, we changed the places you box, you, the little boxes you check for what you give, not just budget, not just building, but a third one, local missions. So all of our adult depart Sunday school department adopted one of those missions. Just what you saw today about the fourth ward. We started putting money out there, mowing lawns, giving out food, knocking on doors, building baby beds, painting buildings, helping them. And every Sunday, I gave two invitations. Remember, David, join the church and leave the church. Join the church and leave. Get out of here. Get out of here. I wish I could have chosen some of the ones that left. But anyway, <laughs> they began to leave. They began to go out there. And hundreds of people went into mission work. Can I tell you something? The day I retired, the church gave me a scrapbook with the names of eight hundred of our people that had gone to seminary, been ordained, went into full-time mission field, mi ministry, over a hundred of them into foreign missions. Why? Because we gave ourselves away. You know what happened? Luke 6, 38 is still in the Bible. With the more we gave, the more God gave to us. The more people we sent out, the more people God sent to us. We'd have five people go over and work at Westview Mission Center. Next Sunday, 25 people to join the church. We'd send a check for 3000 here. Next week, somebody gave us a check for 10000 It happened for 30 years. It has happened for the last eight years. I'm telling you that it does work. If you can get the vision, you can see what God is doing, that this is the strategy, and go home and give yourself away. We'll not only meet the goal, but I promise you, your church will grow. Your ministry will be blessed. God will pour his church life out on you. The DNA of this church is selfless, give yourself away. Last, 
fall, our pastor began preaching through the book of Acts. God burdened his heart with a church planning ministry. He began to challenge the people and told them that we were going to have a pledge Sunday over and above the budget in April and ask everybody to pledge over and above the budget $15 million for two years to plant churches in Houston, across the north, and around the world, maybe 10, 15 churches in the next four to five years. They, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say, did not pledge that $12 million. We missed it completely, ran right past it. They pledged $27 million. Dear friends, God is just waiting. The answer is the cross, and I'm asking you to consider with all your heart what I'm saying. Now, pragmatically, as you leave today, at the door will be a packet of information about what I've been saying about the Send North America Conference that's coming up. Take it with you. Please, everybody, take four or five. Everyone in this room has young pastors in your circle of influence. Put them in their hands. Repeat what you heard. Urge them to go. The Atlanta Conference was the first. The next was at Preston Wood in Dallas, July 29 and 30. Please be there yourself. Please do what it takes. The cost is only a trip up there. Get yourself a place to stay. They'll help you find housing if you need it. And $99 for the two-day conference, which includes four of the best meals you ever had in your life. Speakers are going to include Rick Warren, Jim Cimbala, Johnny Hunt, Jonathan Falwell, conferences, seminars, workshops on church planning, revitalization, music, youth ministry, marketplace ministry. It's going to be awesome. I tell you that when I finished at that commerce down there in Atlanta, 2,500, we're going to have 5,000 at Prestonwood, I saw 2,500 young men jump to their feet, and for two minutes they wouldn't stop cheering and praising God and saying, go, 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 go. They're ready. Find them, encourage them, help them to go, and God can bless and save America. We do have the answer right here in our hands. Southern Baptists have indeed come to the kingdom for such as this, a time as this. Let's pray.